We are continuing to go over information on the Renaissance, your Roman numeral four, and we were in the middle of going over Donatello on the last video. So I just want to remind you, this is the outline that we're currently working on, and we're going to uh, continue on with these Florentine artists. I'm going to do a quick recap of Donatello just to make sure we got everything and then move on to another Florentine artist before we move on to the High Renaissance. So just a couple more things to point out about Donatello. When I mention here uh, that it's the first since antiquity, uh, to be a little bit more specific, it was the first known freestanding nude statue created since antiquity okay so it's actually the first unsupported standing work uh, in bronze that was actually cast during the renaissance so this is definitely making this statue unique um, for this time period later when we go over michelangelo and his sculptings i'll do a little bit of some comparison between uh, what Michelangelo did in his depiction of David versus what Donatello did. So you're definitely going to want to make sure you can point out some of the similarities and differences between the two sculptings. Our next Renaissance artist on your typed outline is Sandro Botticelli, and he is one of the great painters of the Renaissance time period. In fact, um, this is an on the PowerPoint, but I thought it was an interesting point to bring up that he was greatly influenced by Savonarola. Y'all remember the, the priest we talked about um, last week. He was so influenced by Savonarola to the point where, remember when Savonarola had everybody burn their worldly items in the bonfire of the vanities? Well, Botticelli will take some of his own paintings, the ones that were non-religious, and had them destroyed because of the influence that Savonarola had on him. Luckily, one of Botticelli's famous works that you're about to see, The Birth of Venus, uh, was not around during the time of Savonarola. Uh, Botticelli had painted it years before and had actually sold it. So thankfully for the art world, we still have this one-of-a-kind painting that Botticelli did. And you can actually um, go and see it if you are in um, Florence. It's at the famous Uffizi Museum. I've been to that museum and I have seen this um, up close. And it's a beautiful, magnificent painting that I'm going to show you in just a minute. Uh, make sure you know it is a good example of humanism. You can see here the subject is Venus, the Roman god of love. And there it is in all of its glory. So you can see here, standing on this clamshell, this is the representation of Venus, the Roman goddess of love. Of course, this does not do it justice. This painting is unbelievably large. It covers up one, almost an entire wall at the Uffizi Museum. So again, you can't tell the size by just looking at this PowerPoint. But it is a beautiful um, painting by Botticelli. Those of y'all familiar with Botticelli's work, here's another one of his works, La Primavera. You can see here's that image I showed y'all earlier when we were going over the characteristics of painting and the emotion um, that you see in a lot of these uh, human faces. Now we're ready to take a look at the artists during the High Renaissance period. And if y'all remember, by the 1500s, we mentioned how there was a shift in the art from Florence to Rome for different reasons. So we see here during the height of the Renaissance, um, there the center is going to be in Rome. The worldly Renaissance popes provided massive patronage. Again, we've talked about what patronage is. So here are a couple of examples of the popes who spent huge amounts of money purchasing 
um, some of the art in order to beautify their churches or, um, you know, put more emphasis on, you know, God with, with the religious themes of some of these works. So you have Alexander the sixth, Julius the second, and Leo the tenth. Again, all three are what we would call um, popes who will practice patronage. A fun way to remember these high Renaissance artists we're going to go over is just think of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You've got um, Michelangelo, Leonardo, and of course, Raphael. So we're going to take a look at all three of those on an individual basis. We will begin with Leonardo da Vinci. So as you can see here, he is considered the quintessential Renaissance man. Remember, Renaissance man is you are good in many different areas. You're not just a master in one area. You can do many things well. So look at all of the different areas that da Vinci um, was you know, a well master in. He could paint, he could sculpt, he was an architect, he was an engineer, a writer, and even a scientist. So you can see with this image, this was a self-portrait that he did uh, back in 1512. Um, so he is definitely a one of a kind and don't just label him uh, as a master of one area. He is a true Renaissance man. Um, some of his famous works, if you look at your little B on your typed outline, we know, of course, the famous Mona Lisa. More about that one in just a moment. Um, so you might want to just leave some room to write a couple of uh, details about that painting. And then the painting uh, titled The Last Supper, which again, I will go over separately in a moment. But go ahead and jot down that The Last Supper was commissioned by the Sforza family in Milan. So we know that they served as a patron to da Vinci. Okay, they're going to hire him to do a lot of work for them um, in Milan. So that would be a good example if I ask you of a, a patron for da Vinci. It would be the Sforza family. So here is the famous uh, da Vinci painting titled the Mona Lisa. Now notice you don't see anything in red for you to uh, actually write down. I'm going to point out a couple things that you might want to jot down, but by all means, you don't have to write everything you see on this slide. First of all, if you ever want to see this amazing painting, it is in uh, Paris, France, in the famous Louvre Museum. Um, it's basically got, uh, it's been dedicated to an entire room by itself because it gets so many uh, visitors every single year. It's actually rather small. Uh, it's 77 centimeters by 53 centimeters. Um, so uh, those of you that are, you know, good with math and numbers, you know that that is not uh, a very large painting at all. But it has absolutely captivated everyone that goes to see it couple of different stories about uh, da Vinci's Mona Lisa. Um, the most common story you hear about this painting is that um, da Vinci was hired by a merchant um, to uh, paint his wife and the merchant's last name was Giaconda. So that's why you can see here that the painting is often uh, named La Giaconda. Um, by the Italians. So I would uh, make a note of that. Uh, but apparently um, the merchant's wife was named Lisa and um, some believe that it was named Mona Lisa because the word Mona in Italian means Madame or my lady. So, you know, my lady Lisa or Madame Lisa, you know, if you're trying to get the, the technical translation. So again, um, many, many believe that that's, that's what, um, where the painting came from, that da Vinci painted it for uh, the merchant, um, that it was basically a depiction of the merchant's wife and what she looked like. Um, but again, there are other stories because we know da Vinci was extremely attached to this painting. He carried around with him everywhere he went. And um, some even believe 
that it is da Vinci himself of what he would look like as a woman. Um, so again, there's different versions of stories about this painting, but make no mistake, one of the most famous paintings in all of world history. Here is another well-known work of art by Leonardo da Vinci, The Last Supper. We already mentioned who uh, commissioned da Vinci to paint this, and that was the Sforza family in Milan. You can see here at the bottom uh, where you can find this painting today. It is on the wall uh, on, in the convent of Santa Maria del Grazzi um, in, of course, Milan, Italy today. Um, the bad news about this painting is that when da Vinci painted it on the uh, plaster wall, he used tempera paints. He was experimenting. And unfortunately, many believe that that is one of the reasons this painting today is in the condition that it's in. It has greatly deteriorated. Um, it's cracked. It's faded. You can barely make out uh, the figures here. Of course, this is the famous depiction of Jesus and his disciples uh, in the Last Supper uh, from the Bible. So unfortunately, if you were to see it today in person, there's not much left of it. And um, some also think that the heat and the humidity, you know, in Milan also has contributed to this deterioration, um, other than the fact that, that he did experiment with some paints. So there's been controversy about whether it should be restored, but again, this is a da Vinci and um, a lot of care has to be taken, um, you know, to try to keep it from completely fading away. Other than da Vinci being known only for his paintings, remember we said he is the quintessential Renaissance man. So here you can see uh, one of his sketches. He was fascinated with the human body. And so he would often sketch his ideas in a uh, journal that he would keep or what they call a sketchbook. And uh, so you want to write this down that he's known for his detailed studies of human anatomy. He would even go as far as dissect uh, cadavers in order to uh, see the detail of the human body, you know, for art purposes, because that's how intrigued he was. Uh, this particular sketching that you see here is titled The Vitruvian Man. Uh, so make sure you write that down. Um, and that's one, of course, one of his well-known sketchings. And you see it reproduced uh, in the medical world. Uh, we also know, um, you don't have to write this down, but this is just interesting, that in 1994, um, one of his sketchbooks, 72-page uh, sketchbook, because there's 30 of them, they believe, out there, but one of them was sold um, at auction, and of course, the buyer was Bill Gates, and that was back in 1994, and he paid a little over $30 million for one of da Vinci's sketchbooks. Now, of course, he has it out on loan to various museums so that the public can enjoy it. Um, but you can imagine how unique this truly is, and it just gives us rare glimpses of da Vinci's mind and what he was, you know, fascinated with. So we are finished with the information on Leonardo da Vinci. I'm going to go ahead and stop this video to get ready for the next one, which we will go over Raphael.